vaccination through community pharmacies, but at the same time, um, there has been an increasing number of variant vi virus cases. This is a critical moment since Abara is considering step three of easing COVID restriction. It has been already one year since the declaration of pandemic last March, and we are all tired of these restrictions, but let us keep vigilant and be patient. Allow your wisdom and power to the people who are in making critical decision, and we pray that the pandemic will be over in the near future. We pray for EM, um, even though it did not happen yet, we need to think about opening up and normalizing our ministry. We need more core members who can contribute and dedicate to our ministry. We pray especially for a praise team. Uh, we need a praise leader and a group of people to play instruments. The power of listening live praise and singing with a praise team would be a so much blessing for us. We believe in that you are going to send right people to our ministry in the right timing, Lord. Last, we pray for our today's service. We'd like to have eyes and ears to see and hear the truth uh, through your words. Let us open our hearts and receive. Please let the Holy Spirit work in our hearts through this service. Thank you, Lord. We pray in, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so welcome everyone this morning. Thank you for joining in person and online. Uh, please say hello to each other. So there's a couple of announcements. So first of all, we'd like to remind that you can make an offering online through e-transfer using the um, email address ckpc.offering at gmail.com. The next one is uh, Pastor Marvin is thinking about um, Hello? Am I on now? Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, thank you again to uh, Jeremy. Uh, we've had, uh, for the last two weeks, including today, we've had uh, technical difficulties still. And uh, uh, thank goodness for Jeremy, because uh, obviously I wouldn't know what to do. But uh, he's been able to uh, fix these things. And uh, uh, if we're if we're late starting the service, um, you can know that it's uh, uh, it's uh, either Jeremy or, or Tim uh, just trying to uh, get us through these technical uh, difficulties and and uh, uh, but thank thank goodness for them uh, to help us out in these things. Um, yeah. So again, that uh, this chart it's it, it is a simple chart. I guess you don't really need to print it out. You can just kind of uh, grab a piece of paper and write it out. Uh, but basically, on good for the Good Friday service, um, I we will uh, uh, just as a reminder. I said that on the Good Friday service, I'm going to uh, show you or prove to you through through Scripture, through the Bible, that uh, Jesus was not reluctant uh, when he uh, faced the cross. Um, so we do have that Scripture passage that says. Uh, um, uh, take this cup from me, uh, but not my will, but yours be done. And we're going to talk about uh, what exactly that, that phrase meant, uh, what, what Jesus meant when, when he said that phrase, and, uh, and also that uh, uh, throughout Scripture or, or through what Jesus did, uh, what Jesus taught us and what he did,
Hello? Oh, that sounds better. Maybe a little hot. You can turn that down a little bit, please. Okay, sorry about that. I'm sorry that, uh, especially those watching from home, uh, at some point uh, my voice did stop. Um, uh, uh, I'll just move on, and I'll, I'll mention again uh, about the Good Friday service uh, next week, uh, ne next week's announcement. Uh, but just as I was saying earlier, last week I said I would be talking about the Holy Spirit, because uh, during Jesus' final week, uh, we see him mentioning about the Holy Spirit or about the Advocate three times. Okay, so we showed last week how important uh, Jesus' final week was, how much importance uh, each of the Gospels uh, were focused on uh, Jesus' final week. And then, um, uh, and then he mentioned the Holy Spirit three times. But I felt, uh, while I was uh, thinking about this, meditating and preparing, I felt that I didn't have enough time to prepare, uh, to teach about the Holy Spirit. Uh, I didn't have enough time in one week to prepare for this. And I don't think two weeks would have sufficed in teaching about the Holy Spirit. I think uh, when we do talk about the Holy Spirit, it'll, it'll probably be like a three or four week series. And then uh, it will be after Easter. And so today, instead, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, something else I mentioned last week, which was um, this prophecy about Jesus' triumphal entry. Okay. So there's this Jesus' triumphal entry, and then it says uh, that it was uh, a prophecy from the Old Testament, uh, and then uh, that was being fulfilled. And um, we're not specifically talking about the prophecy that was mentioned about the triumphal entry, but we are going to talk about other prophecies. And uh, they come from uh, these, uh, the first two passages uh, in, that's listed on, on this uh, PowerPoint, Luke 24. Acts chapter 8, and the prophecy that we will be going through is in Isaiah 52 and 53. And um, if you just excuse me for a moment, because I forgot to bring my Bible. A little strange having a, a preacher forget to bring their Bible to the podium, but such as it is. Okay. Uh, before we get into our first uh, passage, I want to talk about um, some prophecies in Scripture. Okay. So the title, obscure but scientifically proven, in Isaiah forty chap uh, chapter forty verse twenty two, it says. God sits above the circle of the earth. The people below seem like grasshoppers to him. He spreads out the heavens like a curtain and makes his tent from them. Okay, so God sits above the circle of the earth, right? So this is uh, from Isaiah. Isaiah, oh, I don't know. I don't remember when Isaiah was written. Uh, at, least, uh, at least 700 years uh, before Jesus was born. Uh, could be 1,000. I'm not 100% certain. But anyways... Uh, it says here in this verse that the earth is round. Okay? Now, people have always known that the earth was round, but then uh, they started to question it because, you know, there's a lot of thought that the earth was flat, and it wasn't until the 14 or 1500s AD that it was confirmed that the, worth, that the earth is indeed round. Okay? But Scripture says the earth was round. So we've got this one little verse here. Uh, that does say, uh, talk about the circle of the earth, that the earth being round, okay? But it wasn't confirmed for us until about 1500 AD. The other verse, Job 26, God stretches the northern sky over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing, okay? So the earth, right, we know is floating. I'm not an astronom uh, uh, astrolo astro no, astronomist. I'm not a, I I'm, I'm not a space guy. Uh, but anyways, okay, so the earth is hanging on nothing, which means the earth is floating, right, in space. The earth is floating in space, being held by gravity and, and all of that scientific stuff, right? But we've got these uh, passages um, that write about things that science over time has proven, okay? So we, we've got uh, prophecies and we've got things written about um, our world that uh, it, it's already there. It's already written, 
We just didn't really understand it at the time, not until science proved something, and then we could realize, oh, wait a minute, this is something that God's talked about like 3,000 years ago. Uh, this was already given to us. Okay? So I can say a lot more about science and uh, you know, how, it, how it proves scriptures and things like that, but we won't go there. Okay? So now, why does God communicate this way? Right? Why does God sometimes communicate in a way that um, it's not direct and, and we don't always get it? Right? Especially in the Old Testament, we don't always get it. Okay? So this is a, a secular research. It says that didactic teaching may limit learners' understanding of deep structure of a concept. Oh, uh, Trevor is our uh, resident uh, teacher here. Uh, he would know these things. Whereas guided discovery may result in better learning retention and transfer. Okay, so basically that means is if you're just being told, when, when you're just being told facts, it limits understanding. It limits your deep understanding, and it doesn't bring out, um, uh, you won't be able to recall it as well unless you figure it out for yourself, unless you do the research and figure it out for, for yourself, okay? It helps you to keep it in memory better, and then you can spi uh, regurgitate it again, right? You, you can transfer it, you can spit it out, and, uh, uh, and stuff like that, okay? So, so God would sometimes speak in, uh, indirectly or, or speak in symbols or, or code because he wants you to figure it out. He wants you to study it, to figure it out, to try to understand it, and by doing that, you will actually remember it. When you do figure it out, you will actually remember it better, and you'll be able to teach it better. Okay, so if we were to talk about uh, a favorite uh, childhood game that, that God would enjoy, <laughs> that would be hide-and-seek, okay? God loves to be found, and, and oh, he loves to seek you. He loves to find you, and he, loves, and he loves to be found, right? Jesus came. He came to seek and save the lost, right? So God loves to find you. And uh, he loves to be found, right? So, oops, that's this page. Sorry about that. And then the next one. Okay, so God loves to be found, but we also have help to do that, okay? We've got the promise of the Holy Spirit. And then when there's something you don't understand, we've got the Holy Spirit to help us to understand, right? So um, in John 16, 13, it says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he, he has heard. He will tell you about the future, okay? So um, God speaks in symbols, God speaks in code, but we have the Holy Spirit to help us to understand these things. And so we need to kind of dive deeper in the scripture and try to study it and try to under understand these things. Now, one of my favorite questions, I, I, I teach a seminar on memorizing scripture, and uh, one of my favorite questions to ask people especially when I teach on the passage of the woman caught in the act of adultery. And I ask him, why did Jesus write on the ground? I don't ask him what Jesus wrote on the ground. I ask him why. Why does Jesus write on the ground? Okay? And then I tell him specifically, you need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit for the answer. You need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit for the answer to this question, why does Jesus write on the ground? Okay? When people do that, uh, in, in a class with uh, maybe 10 students, I expect at least, at minimum, four different answers. And if they genuinely pray to God for the answer to this question, I will tell them that their answer is right, even though it might be different from someone else's. Okay? And this is God speaking to us, and this is God speaking to us um, an answer uh, that we need to hear for that season in our lives. This is why it can be different, okay? Uh, but this is, uh, this is coming from the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will speak to us, and, uh, and we can get this information. So, do you guys get it? you understand it? you understand what I'm saying here? Holy Spirit can, uh, can reveal things for us. We can find God through the Holy Spirit, okay? You get it? The disciples didn't get it. They never got it. Disciples never got it. Well, it's not that they never got it. They didn't get it when Jesus was alive, and they still kind of didn't get it uh, after Jesus was resurrected. And we'll talk about that other verse that's uh, not in this list. So reading down this list, John 8, 27, but they still didn't understand that he was talking about his father. Why can't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't even hear me. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. John 12, this is the one that we talked about last week for the, during the triumphal entry. 
His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. And the last one. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that, Jesus, uh, that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Okay. And then the last verse, and this is actually after Jesus rose from the dead during his resurrection and one of his appearances to the disciples. Um, this comes in Acts chapter 1. Verses 6 to 8. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time for, come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Okay. They're still looking for a conquering king. Right? Jesus has rose from the dead, and he's hanging out with his disciples. And his disciples are asking him, are you going to free Israel and, and restore our kingdom? So they're still looking for a conquering king. They still don't get it, even though Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those, those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. Verse 8, very important. But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Okay? So triumphal entry, Jesus was declaring himself king and Messiah. And then everyone else thought he was the conquering king, right? But then the triumphal entry, Jesus was, was emphasizing again, that he came to, to save. He came to die. I mean, he didn't exactly say that on the triumphal entry, but he was saying that throughout his ministry that I came to die and then I will rise again. Okay? They didn't get it. But then, here it is. It, it repeats it. You will receive the power and you will share my message. What is that message? That message is of eternal life in Christ. Okay? That was the message that Jesus brought. That's the message that he gave. And that's the message that he wants his disciples to give. It has nothing to do with, uh, with being a, a military power or, you know, overcoming, um, uh, enemy, uh, mil uh, overcoming uh, enemies uh, militarily or, or anything like that, okay? So we, we've got these things that the disciples didn't get, and, um, and there's, it, 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 it actually keeps going uh, into our passage that we're going to study today. And we will look at Luke 24. Okay, so our two passages today is from Luke and also from, from Acts, and Luke is the one that wrote both of them. Okay, so Luke bo wrote both uh, his gospel and also the book of Acts. Okay, and then it's very interesting because at the end of each one of these passages, or somewhere in the middle, well, I'll just read the I'll just read the first passage uh, first, and then I'll mention. Uh, this unique thing about, unique, uh, about Luke. So Luke 24, verse 13. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were, walk, were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Lazar Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Uh, then some women from our group of, of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to sea, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe that all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus, and the end of their journey Oh, at, and the end of the journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, 
But they begged him, stay the night with us, since it is getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. At that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and, and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. They, they, there they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared, uh, he appeared to Peter. Okay, so Luke wrote both of these things, uh, but Luke doesn't tell us exactly what Jesus said in, in, in both of these situations. So I'll, I'll read the uh, passage in Acts. Uh, but in both of these situations, Luke does not spell out what it is that Jesus talked about. Okay? Now, so, uh, okay. so here we have, wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets explaining to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Okay? So we've got... Um, uh, the, uh, this list of passages here uh, on our screen, uh, we've got some possibilities. We don't know exactly what it is that, that Jesus spoke about, but Luke says he went all the way to Moses. And so I'll just mention a few of these. These are possibly what Jesus spoke about uh, to these two men uh, on the road to Emmaus. Okay? So Genesis 3.15, we've got the promise of the, re of the Redeemer. Genesis 22, Abraham placing his son on the altar. Numbers 29, uh, the bronze snake on, on a pole, okay? So we've got, uh, there's a passage, I think it was in, in John, that says, um, uh, uh, you will see the Son of Man raised up uh, like Moses, uh, like Moses with the snake. Um, Ken might be familiar with this, or, or if you're a medical doctor, the medical symbol for, for healing is it's actually a snake on a pole. Right? It, it comes from this passage in Numbers, a snake on a pole. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, God will raise up a prophet for you. Psalm 22, my life poured out like water. Psalm 69, I endure insults for your sake. Isaiah 9, a child is born. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah 11, a descendant of David. And then Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. Okay? So, uh, we don't know exactly uh, what it is that uh, Jesus shared uh, with these two disciples on the road to em uh, Emmaus, uh, but uh, at least a few of those are probably in there. Now let's turn to our other passage, uh, which is Acts uh, chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go south, down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to, to Gaza. So he started out, and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the Kandake, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of, of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go over and walk along beside the carriage. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, Do you understand what you are reading? The man replied, How can I, unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this, He was led, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent be before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Meanwhile... Philip found himself further north at the town of Azotus. He preached the good news there and in every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. Okay, so once again, we've got 
uh, Philip. Uh, in verse 35, so beginning with the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. Okay, oh, no, I, do, I already have it on there. Okay, um, so we actually have uh, the passage that was being read, that the, that the eunuch was being read, and that passage comes from Isaiah 52, which is what we will be going through um, uh, verse by verse. Okay. So, see, my servant will prosper. He will be highly exalted. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. And he will, he will startle many nations. Kings will stand speechless in his presence, for they will see what they had not been told. They will understand what they had heard about. Okay, so face to skip, face to skip, the, the face disfigured, okay, so obviously this is after being, be being beaten, right? After Jesus was beaten and, and scourged and uh, whipped, okay, his face was uh, deeply disfigured. Um, in Isaiah 53, verse 1, Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? Okay, so now we've got, uh, this comes from John, in John chapter 12, verses 37 to 38. We've got, despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had alone, Jesus had done, most of the people still did not believe in him. This is exactly what Isaiah the prophet had predicted. Lord, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? Okay. All right. I need some reading glasses here. Isaiah 52. 53, rather, 2 and 3. Sorry, my notes are too small for me. I didn't bring my reading glasses. 2 and 3. Rise from the dust, O Jerusalem. Sit in a place of honor. Remove the chains of slavery from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For this is what the Lord says. When I sold you into exile, I received no payment. Now I can redeem you without having to pay for you. Okay? John 1.10, he came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. And then in chapter 7, when the temple guards returned without ar having arrested Jesus, the leading priests and Pharisees demanded, why didn't you bring him in? And they said, we have never heard anyone speak like this. The guards responded, have you been led astray too? The Pharisees mocked. Is there a single one of us rulers or Pharisees who believes in him? Okay, so these are... Um, things that gospel writers are writing out, and these are things that Isaiah had already written about. Okay? Now, again, once I told, I told you before, right? People were looking for a conquering king. Nobody would ever have applied Isaiah 53 to Jesus because this does not make sense. Right? So when we come into Scripture and we have so, a set of preconceived ideas in our minds, even what we read when it doesn't make sense or it doesn't connect with, what we, with the ideas, that, the, the thoughts that we have initially, we're not going to listen to them or, or we're not going to think, well, this has nothing to do with me or this has nothing to do with Jesus. Okay? But these things were already written about him and then Jesus had to explain these things to the two uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus and, and Philip had to explain these things to the, to the Ethiopian eunuch. Okay? That these things are actually written about Jesus and these are the things that actually happened and they, they've already been written about him. Four to six. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Long ago, my people chose to live in Egypt. Now they are oppressed by Assyria. What is this? Asked the Lord. Why are my people enslaved again? Those who rule them shout in exultation. My name is blaspheme all day long. But I will reveal my name to my people, and they will come to know its power. Then they will recognize that I am the one who speaks to them. All right. Matthew 27. So Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead tip whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldier to be crucified. Did I read the right passage? Oh, I'm sorry. I totally, it, it, as I was reading it, it didn't make sense. Sorry about that. Let's get back to. Isaiah 53, 4-6. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was 
it was our sorrows that weighed him down, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Okay? So he was pierced for our rebellion, the whipping, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Things already written. Next two verses. I'm reading from the right chapter. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent bef before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. Matthew 27. But when the leading priests and the elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear all these charges they are bringing against you? Pilate demanded. But Jesus made no response to any of the charges, much to the governor's surprise. Verse 9. He had done no wrong and never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. Matthew 27 again. As evening approached, Joseph, a rich man from Arimathea, who had become a follower of Jesus, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate issued an order to release it to him. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long sheet of clean linen cloth. He placed it in his own new tomb, which had been carved out of the rock. Then he rolled a great stone across the entrance and left. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life was made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in, in his hands. John 1. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience... My righteous servant's servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me, just as my father knows me, and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. Matthew 26. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Now, have you guys ever heard of self-fulfillment self prophecy? Self-fulfillment prophecy is when you hear something about yourself and you make sure it happens. This is self-fulfillment prophecy. Okay? So we know that Jesus knows the scriptures. He knows the Old Testament. It's quite possible that Jesus could just be copying, mimicking after the Old Testament, after what was written. Okay? But there's things that, uh, that were completely out of Jesus' control. Well, such as his birth, his place of birth. Well, it's not like Jesus could control where he was born. Right? Um, the time of birth. He can't control that there's going to be a star above Bethlehem and, and, and he will be born at that time. He can't control that. The manner of birth. Betrayal. Manner of death. People's reactions. Piercing at his side. Right? You can imagine Jesus. Right? He knows that he's going to be pierced. He's going he's to tell... I don't know, one of his disciples, okay, make sure you tell the Roman officer that they need to spear me. They need to, to, to spear me in my belly, okay, right before I die, or no, right after I die, okay? So make sure they do that after I die, right? Jesus is planning his death, right? Can you imagine Jesus 
instructing someone, okay, so right after I die, make sure you stab me. Okay? And before I die, make sure Pilate whips me. Right? You, you, you can't... You can't make these things happen. There's a lot of things that Jesus can't make happen, and yet this one person was able to fulfill every single prophecy written about him in the Old Testament. Okay? So the odds of winning the lottery, it's one in 259 million, or whatever it is with uh, some of our different lotteries that we have. The odds of one man fulfilling eight prophecies. Okay? This... This Isaiah passage alone has about eight prophecies. Okay? So the odds of Jesus being able to fulfill every single one of these prophecies is one in 100 quadrillion. And you can see the zeros on there. I actually had to count it out to figure out what the right word is. Quadrillion. Okay? We've, we've we got, what, 7 billion people on the earth right now? But if we include all of the other people that died, so people of all time and all of history, what do we have? I don't know, 7 trillion? Maybe. So the odds of one person fulfilling eight prophecies, yeah, one in a hundred quadrillion, and yet Jesus fulfilled over 400 prophecies in the Old Testament. That means if Jesus says who he says he is, which is the Son of God, we need to make a decision. Our only conclusion is that it's not circumstantial evidence and that Jesus must truly be who he says he is, that Jesus is the way to heaven. Jesus is the way to eternal life. So if the Son of God tells us how to have eternal life, then you need to make a decision on whether or not you want to follow that. Okay? And I challenge you to compare Jesus to any other uh, false teacher or religious leader in the world. Uh, even people who claim to be the Messiah today. I'm going to find out. Have they fulfilled any of these prophecies that were written about the Messiah? Now, I don't know how. I don't know anyone who claims to be the Messiah today would, would want to die the way Jesus died. Uh, in fact, they just died a natural death. Not, not even remotely close. So here we've got the Son of God telling us how to have eternal life. We need to make a decision on whether or not we want to follow that. And this comes from um, talking about faith in Jesus. Heaven is a free gift. It tells us in Romans chapter 6, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay? This gift is not earned or destroyed. Or, or I've got the wrong word in there. The gift is not earned. God saved, Ephesians chapter 2, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. We are sinners. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. We cannot save ourselves. Okay? But you are but you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Okay? So this requirement to, to be with the Father in heaven, you need to be perfect. And there's not a single one of us that can attain this goal ever. You can't save yourself. And God is merciful. And God is love. Okay? And God is just. Just as God is merciful, God is also just. Okay? Sin must be punished. I do not excuse the guilty, Exodus 34. Okay. Who is Jesus? In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. This is Jesus. This is who Jesus is. Jesus was there before creation. And he is still there today. And what Jesus did, all of us like sheep have gone astray. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. This is what Jesus did. And faith is not mere head knowledge. You say you have faith, for you believe 
that there is one God, good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. Okay? If you remember uh, a couple of weeks ago, I said that um, you know, some people called Jesus Lord, Lord, and Jesus said, well, I'll tell you the truth, I don't know you. In heaven, you stood before God and said, Jesus, I know you, and Jesus says to you, I don't know you. And that would be a little bit scary. Okay? Faith is trusting in Jesus Christ alone for eternal life. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. Okay? And then Jesus promised, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes, he has eternal life. Anyone, I tell you, anyone who believes in me has eternal life. I'm really sorry about that. I want to read one more for you. And then we will pray. This is in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. We have Jesus who declares himself to be the king. He declares himself to be the Messiah. He declares himself to be the son of God. And we know this is true by the way that Jesus lived, but especially by the way that he died and also by the way that he rose from the dead. Now, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, there is no Christianity. There is no, um, there is no salvation through Jesus' blood. And without salvation through Jesus' blood, there is no Christianity. There are no Christ followers if Jesus did not rise from the dead. Now, can you hide the, whether or not Jesus rose from the dead or not? Well, the Pharisees tried, right? They, they put soldiers to guard the tomb to make sure the disciples didn't come to steal the body. Okay? So how is it that disciples still stole the body even, even while there's a team of guards? Okay, so it says that they fell asleep. Okay, it says that the, or the Pharisees told the guards... Just tell everyone that you fell asleep, okay? Well, that's not a very reasonable excuse, but then how could you roll away the stone quietly and not wake up a single person? Well, how can a group of you get to the tomb without waking somebody up? How can you roll away the tomb quietly, the, the stone of the tomb quietly, without waking anyone up, okay? So uh, this thing about hiding Jesus' body is, is totally impossible, Right, But if when, um, as the disciples started to, to declaring to people that Jesus truly rose from the dead, all the Pharisees had to do is, hey, come, here's his body. We have his body. We still have it. It's right here. So what these guys are saying, they're all lying because we have his body. And they don't have his body. They don't have his body. Okay? Jesus fulfills 400 prophecies when it's completely impossible for any one person to, fulf to fulfill eight. Jesus fulfills all of them, and, he, and he, tells he's, he tells us he's the son of God, and he tells us how to have eternal life. We have a decision to make, and we have the promise that says, if you believe in Jesus, and you put your faith in him, and you openly declare your faith in him, well, then you're saved. You have eternal life. I'm going to lead us into uh, what Christians like to call the prayer of salvation. Uh, and then after that, we will play um, the, the third song there uh, as meditation, and then I'll close after that. So let's pray. Uh, Father, as we learn today, Lord, I know that disciples... They, they didn't get it uh, at first, and they didn't even get it even when they saw your resurrected body. Uh, but I know, Lord, when you sent the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit spoke to their hearts, they got it. And I know, Lord God, that uh, the Holy Spirit speaks to us. I know, Lord, also that the Holy Spirit speaks to uh, unbelievers, um, those who have not yet uh, committed their lives to you. Because the Holy Spirit speaks truth, I, I know, Lord, that people are receiving truth in their hearts and that um, 
now that they have received the truth, they have a decision to make whether or not to commit their lives to you um, or not. And so from this moment, Lord, I want to uh, just pray this prayer of commitment that for those who want to commit their lives to you um, would also pray the same in their own hearts um, so that we can receive eternal life from you and, uh, and become brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I just confessed my sin to you, Lord God. Um, I am a sinner, Lord, and I need your forgiveness. Uh, without your forgiveness, um, I am nothing, and I have no way of earning my way to you. So I ask that you forgive me of my sins. I receive your son into my life. I believe by faith that your son died for me and has given me uh, eternal life through his blood. I thank you, Lord, uh, for who you are and giving me life. And I pray, Father, that you help me to understand your word so that I will know how to govern my life and also to be able to share this good news to others as well. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Sin washed away. I owe. 
Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you again. Uh, just a wonderful morning. And we thank you, Lord, for Jeremy, who could just, uh, in such a short time, resolve uh, the challenges and issues that we're facing. Uh, but we do pray, Lord, uh, even as um, uh, Ken uh, prayed for us, Father, is uh, that you would bring people, um, uh, a worship team. Uh, you would bless us with a worship team, Lord God, and uh, and also others, uh, Lord, who, who could uh, share um, the load of, of, of the media team um, uh, for one person to do sound and, and another to just focus on um, our presentation. And so would you bless, bless us, Lord, uh, that you'd bring people uh, into our services, um, not only to worship together, Lord, but just uh, to be in fellowship and to be able to encourage one another and to uh, share your good news with one another. And we do thank the Lord so much for this time. And I do pray, Father, that uh, for any who uh, may have uh, given their lives to you uh, at this time, Lord, that um, you would also lead them uh, into a fellowship uh, where they can be discipled, where they can continue uh, in their learning, and um, uh, and just have someone to, to guide them um, in, in your word. Uh, we do thank you again, uh, Lord, for this day. And now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, who ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Sing. Hello. Hello, sing. Be like the little mermaid. Sing, sing. Okay, I'm ready. 